20th of November 1979 appeared to be a normal day in the city of Mecca. The Fajr Adhan was called and hundreds of thousands of people began to line outside of the gates to go inside of the Haram to pray the typical Fajr prayer. However, this day was going to become an infamous day in the history of the Ummah. This day, by all appearances, started out normal. But by the end of the day, an incident, the likes of which the Ummah has never seen, occurred. After the Fajr prayer finished, this day, the 29th of November, 1979, which corresponded to the first of Muharram, 1400 Hijrah. After the Fajr prayer finished, led by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Subayyil, who is still one of the Imams of the Haram, immediately after this, a few gunshots were heard inside of the Haram. And then there was some commotion in the front lines, and a person stood up and grabbed the microphone that Imam Subayyil was leading the Fajr prayer with. A number of other people stood up and overpowered the guards surrounding Shaykh Subayyil. And then this announcer, started speaking this announcer started announcing he started talking about the corruption of the present state and regime and the evils that were rampant in society and the fact that so many of the signs of the day of judgment were being fulfilled in front of their eyes and he then began to mention that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam predicted that a mujaddid a renewer of the religion would come every 100 years and he then mentioned the hadith about the Mahdi. This figure that will come towards the end of times when all of the earth is filled with injustice and evil. And he said, this is that time. And he then said, we have the Mahdi in our midst. And he told a certain person to stand up and called him to the microphone. And he said, oh Muslims, this is your Mahdi. Give bay'ah to him. Give the oath of allegiance to him. And this person, whose name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah from the tribe of Qahtan, the pure tribe of Quraysh, of the descendants of Quraysh. This person, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qahtani, stood there. And the announcer, whose name was Juhayman ibn Saif al-Utaybi, the announcer then demanded from all of the Muslims in the Haram that this is the Mahdi. He is standing between the Rukun and the Maqam, between the Hajr al-Aswad and the Maqam of Ibrahim. He's standing there. And he says this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said, that the Mahdi will stand between the Hajar Aswad and the station of Ibrahim. And he said this person, is name, his name is Muhammad, just like the Mahdi's name will be. And his father's name is Abdullah, just like the Mahdi's father's name will be. And he shall be from the tribe of Quraysh, just like this person is from the tribe of Quraysh. And he mentioned all of these conditions. And he said, you must now give bay'ah to this man. The Muslims, of the Haram. The average Muslims, most of you have been there. Many of them could not even understand what is happening. They didn't understand Arabic. Others were totally bewildered and confused. What is happening? Gunfire, gunshots. When they tried to leave in the chaos and pandemonium, they found that the doors of the Haram had been barricaded shut. And each of these doors was armed. Armed guards stood there. Not of the Haram, of the army of Juhayman al utaybi and lo and behold, for the next week and a half, for the next so many days, the Haram itself, the Kaaba was held hostage. The Kaaba was held hostage and nobody was allowed to enter or leave for some days until finally Juhayman's group allowed the other Muslims to leave who did not want to remain there. They could not feed them and, uh, uh, and take care of them. So they allowed the other Muslims to go after three, four days. But they themselves, the army of Juhayman, the quantities have differed. Some ulama said, uh, sorry, some historians said 200, others said up to a, a thousand. We don't know the exact quantity of the army that he had, uh, had, had assembled. But they had taken the haram hostage. And they did not allow any Muslim to come in. And for all of these days, tawaf around the house was stopped. The call for prayer was stopped. The jama'at was stopped. This has hardly ever occurred in the history of the Ummah. The last time this occurred was in this incident, 1979. And as the sun rose up and dawn broke into the early day, 
the Saudi police and the Saudi authorities were totally confused as to what to do. They didn't even understand firstly what is going on, what is happening. A total surprise. And when they sent armed, when they sent policemen, when they sent some of the army to try to find out, Juhayman had stationed snipers on the minarets of the Haram. These tall towering, you know, minarets of the Haram. He had stationed marksmen, expert rifle, you know, uh, 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 people who could shoot down anybody who's coming. So any policeman, any guard came and he was killed immediately. Blood was shed in the Haram. And so the authorities began to have meetings, negotiations. They didn't understand even what is happening. It took them a whole day to figure out this was a group who claimed to have the Mahdi in their midst. Sheikh Subayil himself, when all of this is happening and the announcements were taking place, immediately he understood this is a group of fanatic extremists. And while all of this is taking place, he lost himself in the crowd. He did not want to be held hostage for no reason. And he managed to escape wearing the clothes and the garment of a woman, wearing the hijab and the abaya of a woman. He managed to escape in the crowd. And he was one of the main sources of information to the authorities, describing to them what exactly was happening inside of the haram. The Saudi authorities tried certain tactics, but the people in this, uh, inside the haram were adamant. They would not leave until the royal family abdicated, until they gave up the power, until this, why all of these conditions were met. And of course, these conditions would never be met no matter what anybody does. So the, 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 the authorities decided that they're going to storm the Kaaba itself. They're going to send the military, the army in to fight these people. Therefore, after around eight or nine days, they sent in the elite military. They sent in paratroopers. They sent in army tanks. The tanks went up the same stairs of the, of the haram that we all have used. They went up these steps and they broke down the barricaded doors of the haram. And hundreds of military men stormed inside the very structure that we know. It is the same structure. It wasn't rebuilt again. And a war ensued inside the Kaaba, inside the Haram itself, in the shade of the Kaaba. A war ensued. And what happened was that the, 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 the followers of Juhayman al Utaybi, they barricaded themselves in the basement of the Haram. Those of you who have gone recently, you know that there is a basement inside the, the, uh, the ground floor from the Kaaba. You walk up, up the steps. Immediately as you walk up the steps, you will find other steps going down. For many years, those basement doors were shut. Those of you who went throughout the 80s, those doors were shut. You saw them, but they were never opened. Early 90s shut. Only recently when the memory died down, when all of that uh, fear and whatnot was, was finally quelled, only recently the doors have been opened. What happened was the army of Juhayman or the followers of Juhayman, they took shelter in these basements. And the advantage of this was that these basements, they only had one way in, which was those stairs. So any person tries to come, they can immediately shoot and kill him. So hundreds of people were barricaded inside this basement. And the authorities figured out that there was no lack of water firstly. Well, the water was available. Where was the water coming from? Zamzam. And then there was no lack of food because these people had carried in bags of dates. And they questioned where did they get the guns from? They figured out that the guns had come in the Fajr prayer, the Fajr of the same day, they had brought in bodies, janazas, but there were no bodies inside those green sheets. They were full of semi-automatic weapons, rifles and guns. Instead of people and corpses, there were weapons meant to create corpses. This is what those people brought in. And in those days, there wasn't much checking. Those of you who have lived in Arabia, in the last 20 years, you all know how strict it is. You cannot leave your house without iqama. You cannot enter a city without permission. In the 70s, there was no such thing. It was this incident that changed the entire system of Arabia. It was this incident that caused so much panic for good reason that they changed the entire system of people residing in Arabia and coming in and coming out. It was this one incident. So at that time, they could just walk in carrying these 
uh, these buyers, these, these uh, the janazas, once upon a time nobody checked. Now if you try walking in, you need to show a piece of paper from the government. This is really a dead body, there must be a doctor certified, this is a legal procedure. Back then people did not think that they could, any human being could do this to the, any Muslim could do this in front of the Kaaba. So they walked in carrying all of these hundreds of guns. And the people obviously came in unarmed, but they had the guns there. So immediately after the Fajr, they took these arms, they stationed themselves. All of this was pre-planned. Every person was assigned a place and what to do. So as we said, for eight days, the authorities were confused what to do. Finally, the ulama gave the fatwa that these people are renegades. They are bughat. They are people who are working against Islam and, and, and the Muslims. It is not possible that the real Mahdi would do these tactics. And so they gave the fatwa, it is permissible to bring the army in. Because generally speaking, fighting is not allowed inside the haram. It is prohibited. The only time it is allowed is in self-defense as in this case. So they gave the fatwa, it is permissible. Therefore, hundreds of armies came in, paratroopers, tanks, military personnel, all of them. And we said a small battle, a small war ensued between pillar to pillar, guerrilla warfare. Literally, between the pillars of the Haram, there's people there on this side and this side. Hundreds, hundreds of Muslims died. Hundreds of Muslims died. Many of them the followers of Juhayman, many of them of the Saudi police force. And in this battle, in this battle, this supposed Mahdi himself, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, also was killed. He was killed as well. Juhayman was caught alive. Juhayman ibn Sayf al utaybi was caught alive. Along with around 70 of his followers, the rest were all killed in the battle. And of the tactics they used, it is said, and of course all of this is very secret information in the sense we don't know a lot of these details because the government does not wish to release it, does not wish to publicize the statement. But of the tactics they used, they flooded the basement with water. They first tried burning tires that didn't work. They threw in burning tires that didn't work. Then they flooded the basements with water and they threw in live electric wires into the water to electrocute the people there. And so eventually whoever was re remaining there, they had to come out smoked and smogged and their faces soot and black and all of the dust on it. And eventually these 70 people were captured and within the space of two, three days, they were executed all around the kingdom, starting with Juhayman himself. He was executed in front of the, the, the Haram itself uh, in the following few days. And there is some video footage as well of Juhayman after his capture. They had a, a camera there and you can see his face is totally black because of the, the effects of the burning, uh, the burning fire and the tar and, and the tires that they threw in there. And you can see his face and, and it is recorded in video and his confession and everything is recorded. It is available even on the internet. This incident that occurred brought to limelight a concept that many Muslims had forgotten about for a long time. And it was the concept of the Mahdi. What is this thing called the Mahdi? Do we as Sunnis believe in a Mahdi or is this a Shia concoction? Do we Sunnis also believe in the Mahdi? If we do, what is the difference between our beliefs and the beliefs of the Shia? And so much research was done afresh during this time. And many ulama wrote books, including many scholars of Medina. Of them are Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Musa al-Abbad. And of them, Sheikh Ibn Maz gave many fatwas. And other ulama, they wrote track, tracks and publicized books and gave fatawa to discuss the concept of the Mahdi. Are you tired of all these annoying ads on YouTube? Are you worried that a haram video might pop up? Well, the One Islam TV app is here to solve these problems, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is 100% free of any ads and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest or drive with your device switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets, and so much more. Two to four new videos uploaded daily, inshallah. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means a small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders. Insha'Allah.
The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.